Well, that means I never remember. Yeah, let, let clama. That's uh, close enough. The clama. Okay. Very good. And um, um, well, I don't know. Let's just jump in. Um, okay. Anytime you're ready, uh, Heinz. Yeah, I'm all ready. Take off. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. You can hear me okay? Oh, I got to turn on the, hang on. Yes, I can. Can everybody else? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Okay. Well, let's get started then. Okay. Yeah, my, my name is Heinz uh, Leclama. Up in, um, I'm up here in Washington State. Uh, used to live in California. Used to live in a bunch of other places too, but now in uh, Washington State. And uh, I have actually have a, uh, uh, a group up here which does apologetics and we cover creation versus evolution, general Christian apologetics and uh, biblical worldview. And I, I speak on all of those topics and uh, also on the one tonight, which is uh, maybe doesn't quite fit those, but I'll, I'll fit it into evolution and, and uh, you can see what, where it has some commonality. Um, so I've been uh, um, looking at global warming since 2009. Um, and uh, it, it struck me as interesting because I saw at that time, there seems to be a lot of controversy in that topic. And uh, why, why is that? I said, okay, let's look at it. Well, it didn't take me very long when I discovered the reasons for that uh, difference of opinion. And uh, so we'll see some of that as we go into it. My, my background is in physics. I have a doctorate in uh, nuclear physics. And I, I uh, worked in the high-tech industry for more than 45 years. And um, I've also done teaching from the Bible, Bible studies, and teaching Sunday school, uh, sermons, you know, all that. So with that, the topic here is, do we have a climate crisis? So I'm going to step through these uh, uh, slides. Um, I'm going to wrap, go through some of them really rapidly, but I want you to know that all of my slides are up on the website once I finish the talk. I'll also send Jim a link to the recording of this talk uh, after we're done. And so all that should be up on the internet within a, a few days. So if you want to follow up later on, uh, you can do that. Okay, so let's see. Uh, gotta... All right, so, so this is what we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to talk about global warming claims made by some scientists, particularly in the IPCC. And, um, and we're also going to look at some actual facts about climate and global warming. And I use those two terms interchangeably. Obviously, it started out to be global warming, but when people realize that uh, temperatures both move both ways, they uh, change it to climate change. So I'm going to not spend a whole lot of time on the science, but just introduce some of the issues about the greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases that, uh, that might cause global warming. And then a little bit about the two major organizations involved in this research. Major one, of course, is uh, UN IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change. And uh, that pulls from people from um, hundreds, uh, probably 140, 50 different countries. Uh, they send people to that, not just scientists, but also other bureaucrats. Um, and that, so those are big international meetings. There's another group called the NIPCC, which stands for Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. And uh, they are scientists who are not associated with the government. They are not necessarily um, uh, university professors, but they are scientists and they have done a, a, a very valid critique of what the IPCC has come up with. And we'll go into that. But the basic talk I'm gonna cover on, uh, talk about 16 key issues that we should look at when we talk about climate change and global warming. Uh, but before I get into that, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, 
a little bit of history. But by the way, somebody doesn't have their, their microphone muted that uh, they reflect in this talk. But to, anyway, to begin, what is their biblical mandate? Well, I think that's given very clearly in these three verses of the Bible. Uh, first of all, Genesis 1.28, be fruitful, multiply it, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Well-known verse. And then further in Genesis 8.22, we remember this verse, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not see. In other words, we will always have seasons uh, promised by God. And then the other valid thing that when we do research, we as scientists need to test everything, hold fast to what is true. We do that not just in, uh, in science, but also in theology. So when I look at climate change, global warming issues, I wanna make sure that people are telling the truth. I test it and uh, see if they're telling the truth. Uh, highlight, here are some man-made climate change claims. And most of these are predictions from uh, the UN IPCC. Um, and of course, the, uh, um, the, the, the global warming guru, uh, Al Gore, um, they would say they predict that the uh, global warming is real. And in fact, it's caused by humans. Uh, if we don't do something about controlling the temperature, uh, they expected the temperature to, the average global temperature to increase up to 2100 by the end of this century. Um, that, now that sounds like a, a big change. But the other projections they make is um, uh, the Arctic ice cap, I meaning with all this warming, it's going to disappear. Polar bear population will decline. Sea level will, will rise by as much as 88 centimeters by 2100. Um, we'll have increased drought, extreme weather, more storms, heat waves, more wildfires, et cetera. We'll go cover that. And uh, this, is the most, this is the most significant threat to mind, mankind. If we don't do something about it, we're really in trouble. Okay, that's from the ICCC. So what's the reality? Well, here you have some of these projections by different uh, organizations. Uh, these are mostly government organizations. They said, uh, you know, if we go you know, from this zero, which is some average global temperature, and we're now at 2020 uh, here, uh, the temperature could increase by as much as five degrees centigrade. And so th this is where that five degrees centigrade comes from. Um, the IPCC has come out with five different reports over the years. They do about every six, seven years. The first report, 1990, they acknowledge that temperature has changed over the years. And looking back a thousand years, um, they do recognize that we had the medieval warm period. And they recognize that we had a little ice age around the 16, 17, 1700s. Uh, AD. And now we, here we are here. And notice that this here we are here is definitely below the medieval uh, period. However, 11 years later, they come up with a second report. And here's their picture now, going back to a thousand. You'll see the, the range of uncertainty, but the average here, the blue, uh, is pretty uh, cool. Uh, and notice that the somehow the medieval warm period disappeared. They do acknowledge a little ice age, but not much. And then all of a sudden we have a huge temperature rise. Well, huge. I mean, if you look at the scale, it's only you know half a degree, but nevertheless very different from previous. And that's where you get the, that term you may have heard of, the hockey stick chart. Okay, so you have from that previous graph from 1,000 to 2,000, you know, pretty average, not, not, nothing big, and then all of a sudden a spike. And uh, they uh, attribute that to fossil fuel. And here's another way of looking at it. Uh, the original version uh, with the hockey stack 
So you see that in pink, promoted by the ICC, IPCC. Um, and, and they said, well, look at obviously the, this century is the warmest ever going back to the 1400s. But the correct version, if you look at those other charts and, and other charts will show you, uh, it really you know, was warmer back in the 1400s than it is today. So they, they adjust the curve to suit their agenda. And here's another way to look at it. Uh, the met, verified MET office data temperature showing lower temperatures in the blue line. Not, nothing big, but there's a, seems to be a spike here and they come back down. But the, what the uh, NOAA shows, the red line, you'll see it's higher on average than all the blue lines. So there's not a general agreement in the uh, different communities about that, what that curve really should look like. And that's, of course, only in the last 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> here's another graph which really shows what's going on. There's a red line going from 1979 uh, all the way up to 2015, 2016. Okay, you'll see the average one that the dark red line going through there. The blue line, they have adjusted this. And you see, it's pretty close to the red line, starts to, to drift a bit in 2003. And then 2015, all of a sudden, the red line goes away. They drop that, and everything is higher. And so it's, it's a little bit uh, misconstrued. And here's another, it really shows what's happening here. NASA, 1999, the, you can see the curve there. Notice that they show correctly, in 1999, that the temperature there is lower than the temperature in the 1930s. But now, in 2019, all of a sudden, uh, you know, that is lower than it is today. So there's some adjustment being made to these temperatures. Why is that? The other thing we've, we've seen, uh, there's been no real global warming for 19 years on average. And we'll come back to that, a little bit more history. 1973, for those of you that are old enough to remember, Time Magazine uh, cover had Time the Big Freeze. It was really cold in the 1970s. 1977, the Big Freeze. And then all of a sudden, 25, 30 years later, we are we have global warming in our hands. And this is a 2006 special report on global warming. How can that be? What's changed? The global, um, uh, the global cooling alarmers back in the, the 1970s were Governor Brown, the governor of, uh, of your um, state down there. And uh, Dr. John Holdren, who's a well-known scientist and Dr. Paul Ehrlich, they're all uh, screaming about, it's getting cold. We got to do something about this. And then all of a sudden, 30 years later, uh, we have some of the same global warming alarmists. Used to global cooling. Now they're, they're warning us that the, it's warming too fast. Basic change, same people, same scientists even. You know, how can that be? Jerry Brown. Um, 1977, global cooling. Uh, and then as a Jerry Brown, he had a second term. Now he's warning about global warming. Same guy, what changed? Okay, and he blamed, first of all, he blamed the drought on, um, on cooling. And then later he, he blames the drought on warming. As you can see here. So uh, it doesn't matter, hot, cold, you know, we still, we, we got a crisis, got to do something. And of course, this guy, you know, Al Gore said the entire polar cap will disappear in five years. That was in 2008. Well, here we are, you know, seven years ago in 2013, and uh, the polar, North Pole cap is doing fine, thank you. 
Uh, here's a, just a little bit of science. I won't go into all the details, but basically scientists measure the, you know, the incoming energy flows, mostly from the sun, incoming solar radiation, and then measured in uh, watts per square meter. And uh, you know, it goes in different directions. Some of it is reflected by clouds and goes back into the uh, uh, atmosphere. Some is reflected by the surface of the Earth and some is ab absorbed by the surface. And then on the outgoing, you have uh, um, you know, some by surface radiation. You know, this is the uh, uh, infrared radi radiation going back, reflected from the surface. And some of it comes back and is absorbed by radiation. So there's flows of energy going coming through the Earth, which is of course the Mercury, the Sun, and then there's various reasons of course for uh, uh, the heat being reflected back up. So what controls the global warming? Well, is the uh, the cloud layer is a big determinant of that, because if if more heat is reflected from that cloud. Um, obviously, the, the Earth will be cooler, and uh, so there's various factors which fit into that. But here, remember, the IPCC says that um, uh, global warming is largely caused by carbon dioxide. Now, some of this depends on whether you include water vapor, because actually, water vapor is a big part of greenhouse gases you know, 95%. And realize that most of this water vapor is natural, 99, 95% actually. And very, very little is man-made. Even on the carbon dioxide, you got 3.6% uh, and uh, you got um, natural, it's mostly 3.502. And then man-made is 0.117%. And then the others are, are smaller. And uh, we're, we're not gonna look at those um, in, in this uh, lecture here. Another way of looking at that, uh, this again with water vapor, uh, you'll see uh, most of the greenhouse gases in this model is water vapor and a little bit the green is man-made. And for all of these here, and here's that 0.117 um, man-made in carbon dioxide. So of all the carbon dioxide that's emitted into the atmosphere, most of that, 97%, is natural. Man only contributes about 3.2%. And if you look at without water vapor, you know this is still the same. You know, the man-made is still the same percentage of the natural uh, or of the overall emission of carbon dioxide. So. You know, whatever man does, you know, he is not affecting, you know, the, uh, uh, the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere very much. And then you see the other contributors there. So what it comes down to, man-made carbon dioxide contribution causes only 0.117% of Earth's greenhouse effect factoring in water vapor. Without water vapor, it, it, it's, um, I think, 0.2 or something. And, uh, but nevertheless, it's insignificant. insignificant. OK, so that, that's a little background on some of the science and what the uh, um, determinants of global warming and climate change is. So now I'm going to start looking at the 16 different key issues that we need to look at. First of all, climate is always changing. You know, this is called climate change, but you know, there's nothing magic about it. Climate always changes, we know that. And uh, here's a, another picture that I showed you before the uh, uh, medieval warm period and then the little ice age. And here's a more detailed picture uh, going back to uh, actually 2400 uh, BC. But what's important, looking at uh, uh, you know, zero uh, AD, you see there, there was a warm period in Roman Empire days. There was a cold spell here before the medieval warm period. And then you had a little ice age. And, uh, and then you, you have 
um, you know, warm periods here, but they're you know, not as big um, as the medieval uh, warm period. And there's various other um, uh, major, what they call major temperature changes shown in this chart. And I'm not gonna go over them. They're just, the important thing is that there's cycles of cold and warm. And notice this here shows that we are actually in, into a cooler period than we were way up here. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at some of these others in a little detail, but there's many different temperature changes in our history. Issue number two, we have to recognize that carbon dioxide is required for life. Carbon dioxide actually increases the food production. It, and you know, people often call carbon dioxide as a pollutant. Well, it's not a pollutant. That's, you know, life depends on carbon dioxide. There are other pollutants that definitely we need to control, but uh, carbon dioxide is not one of them. Here is a, just a sample, 1980 to 2007, a world grain production in that period. And obviously it has been increasing. And the, the temperature has been uh, increasing slightly. So that's a good thing. And here's another one. Um, this, this here, this is the, the corn yield over the years from uh, 1850, uh, all the way up to uh, well, roughly 2010. And uh, on the right here, we have the list of the major contributors to carbon dioxide emissions. And it's interesting to note that the largest contributors are uh, China, India somewhat, but not as uh, much. And then the US obviously is there as well, and then Europe. So th these are the major contributors to carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, but nevertheless, more carbon dioxide up to a limit contribute to better food production. Issue number three, and this is a little longer, science is not settled. You know, Al Gore liked to say, science is settled. Don't, no, don't argue about it, science is settled. Uh, but notice he will not debate other climate scientists who just takes it as settled, but is far, far from settled. Uh, here are some examples of box predictions. Uh, Dr. John Holgren, uh, he was uh, Obama's science advisor. He was also a science advisor to Jerry Brown in California. Um, and he made these predictions, some of these, and all of them have come to naught. You know, the, the UN has overestimated global warming. You know, you, you can see that even by 2015, that they're way off. They said all rainforest species will be extinct. Oil will run out. Also, we haven't done that. Arctic ice, sea ice will disappear. Look at the future, a billion people could die because of climate change. And that in 1971, member Hogan said, a new ice age is out there. And here's some other actual pronouncements, um, you know, all the way back to 1970, going to 2014. And uh, I'll just read a few of them. Uh, 1976, global cooling will cause a world war by 2000. Uh, 1990, we have five to 10 years to save the rainforest. Um, 2000, snow will soon be a thing of the past. 2007, global warming will cause fewer hurricanes. 2012, global warming will cause more hurricanes. You know, it's ever what the, the mood of the day is. Arctic ice will, uh, the Arctic will be ice free by 2013. We know that hasn't happened. Nevertheless, IPCC, Al Gore says, the science is settled. Okay, just to remember, we have this 2000 years of uh, global uh, temperatures that we go by, and notice the, the range there isn't really that big, you know, up by 0.6 from the average to down as far as uh, you know, almost 0.6 in the little ice age. So about one degree difference is centigrade in that, those periods. So it's not, not a whole lot that we're talking about. 
Um, here, here's a period from 1880 to 2000. And uh, we do, we have increased hydrocarbon, you know, CO2 emissions over that period of time, as you can see. And I, I don't have a scale here, but we'll get to that in some other charts. Uh, but notice that the temperature, the average temperature, um, was pretty flat here, 1880, and then it went up to a higher period in uh, up to 1930. And then, then it went down, even though the carbon dioxide was still increasing, and then it went back up again. And notice it, it, the, this curve, the blue curve, is matched better by solar activity you know, than it is by the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Um, here's another one that's uh, linked to that. Remember that carbon has increased to, it's now over 400 parts per million. And yet, you know, the temperature doesn't track that. It, see, it's going way up here and the temperature has come down here. So it doesn't, it, carbon dioxide can't be the major contributor. And here's uh, another way of looking at it. Um, most of these temperature are determined by ice core samples back here. But now, of course, for the last 100, 150 years, we can measure them by thermometers. And lately, from, up from 1979 till now, we can measure tem temperature in the atmosphere using satellites. And it turns out satellites are much more accurate in tracking temperature than thermometers are. Okay, here, here's that, coming back to that hockey stick, which has got us um, the UN IPCC on this track of, of warning us about global warming. Now, the, the man that, that uh, predicted that, Michael Mann, you know, very highly publicized. And uh, Tim Ball, who is a Canadian climate scientist, one of the original climate scientists from Canada, he's been in the business for 50 years. Uh, he he um, uh, issued a lawsuit against Michael Mann. He said, Science? Yes. Science? Can I pause you for just a second? Yeah. We're having trouble hearing you here in this, uh, in this room. Uh, let me just turn people's um, mics back on so they can respond. I want to ask if um, they can hear you all right. Can you, can you hear it okay? Up, down. Um, okay. Can you hear it in the room, Jim? Not very well. Um, I don't know, is there anything you can do on your end to increase the volume? I've got my speakers all the way up. Yeah, no, I, I can hear you very loud and clear. Okay. And and then and I'm set at I believe hundred percent. Okay. Microphone, so I I really can't. Um, I I could have. Uh, let's see. Bob Reinhardt, I see your your mic is back on. Can you respond? Can you hear all right? Can can they hear okay? I'm not getting any response. Okay. okay. Um, I'll sit. A little soft, okay. Okay, I'll I'll sit closer to the microphone and see if that helps. Okay, is that better? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. So I'm just saying that Tim Ball issued a lawsuit against Michael Mann and challenged him to uh, produce the data, which made it come up with this hockey stick projection. Well, he refused to give him the data, and uh, the lawsuit. Uh, uh, ended up that uh, Michael Mann had to pay for all of Tim, Tim Ball's uh, legal costs because he refused to give him the data. And uh, because I'm, I'm afraid that if he had had to show him the data, he would have seen that this is a lie. That's not really backed by real data. Okay, a little bit about the NIPCC, the Non-Governmental -Gover International Panel on Climate Change. You know, the, the, this organization consists of scientists and scholars and they're, they're climate um, you know, scientists. And they issue peer re review technical papers. They have an annual conference on climate change and they, they uh, critique 
the IPC um, reports when they come out. Uh, here are some of their four important reports. They have concluded that nature, not human activity, rules the climate. Climate change reconsidered one or two. Science, they have scientific critiques of IPCC's summary for policy makers. And then they have another important booklet on why scientists disagree about global warming. And here, here's the uh, cover of that book. Some of the, the important findings, um, there is no consensus among scientists, climate scientists. Um, they explain you know, why scientists disagree. Um, they claim that they, they use the scientific method. The IPC is uh, clearly controlled a little bit by politics, political science, bureaucrats. There, some of their projects are claimed to be false and their postulates are claimed to be false. And the, um, they have policy implications because of these faulty um, models that they've come up with. Okay, issue number four, uh, carbon dioxide cannot drive global warming. Um, and I, I made that claim before, but there are four different possible causes of global warming. Um, uh, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that's what the IPCC claims. But in reality, as we saw, the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gases, the, uh, the carbon dioxide percentage of the greenhouse gases is so insignificant that it really can't be a determinant of global warming. Global warming just by sunspots. There are cycles in, in the, the sunspots. Um, can global warming be caused by that? Well, it turns out the influence is too small uh, by just considering only sunspots. However, there is an important thing that scientists have discovered that uh, the cloud cover uh, has a lot to do with controlling the climate on the earth. And uh, and, and I'll, I'll show you a few charts on that in a bit. And then the fourth thing is what we call Pacific decadal oscillation in the oceans. In other words, the oscillations in the oceans, which have other causes, can also um, make contributions to increased um, global warming. But again, all these things occur in cycles. So one scientist, uh, wrote a booklet, and this is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a skeptic's handbook. He said, if, if global warming is truly caused by carbon dioxide, these four things must be true. There must be a certain hot spot that shows up in the warming patterns, and they don't see that. They said the, the Vostok ice cores do not show carbon dioxide uh, pushing up temperatures. Um, Temperatures are not rising, you know, since 1999 to about 1980 or 2018, the temperature curves have been fairly flat. And carbon dioxide is already doing almost all the warming it can do. In other words, if you double the amount of carbon dioxide uh, into the air, that won't make twice the, the amount of difference. And I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. Okay, here is the, uh, this is the red line here, the curve. Uh, and again, there's cycles within that curve, but this is a measurements made of carbon dioxide in the air in Hawaii on top of a mountain, Mauna Loa. And the uh, reason why that's significant because that is, is pretty well uh, uninhabited. So there, there's no contribution of, of uh, you know, vehicles or other fossil fuel burning. So that's pretty good. And it, it shows increases. And then you get global temperature anomalies here down below. You'll notice that carbon dioxide here is increasing, but the global temperature is decreasing. And then here, yes, it's increasing up to uh, 
40, 50 years here, and then all of a sudden it leveled off. So the, the correlation is rather weak. So to say that carbon dioxide is the major contributor to global warming is not uh, factual. Um, here, here is the, what I said about the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You know, if you start out, uh, you know, we are now at uh, 420 or so. Uh, but if you go back to the beginning, you know, what happens if you need at least 140 parts per million to have plant growth. Uh, and during the ice ages, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of change. It was increasing a bit. Pre-industrial level, it was still increasing. You know, it's been increasing all this time here. And then in 2010, it got to 380. But again, you'll notice from, from 200 to um, 400, you know, that's doubling the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That has not caused a significant warming. Okay, issue number five. This is, this is the second possible cause of, uh, well, second and third. Uh, first of all, if, if you just look at these sunspots on the sun, and you, uh, you have some curve here, so the number of sunspots uh, per time frame, per cycle is there. And you'll see that there's no direct correlation just with the sunspots. And then this is, again, this is the carbon dioxide concentration in the air, 380 parts per million. Um, but here's this other chart I showed you. There is correlation with solar activity, however, not, not the sunspot, the solar activity, the solar irradiance. And uh, you'll see here the, the red, um, the solar activity um, is, is, uh, follows that curve, or the temperature follows that curve of solar activity quite well on average from 1880 to 2000. In other words, they, many scientists believe that solar activity is a primary cause of uh, increase in temperature. Okay, then we come to uh, total uh, solar irradiance. And that is the, the um, it turns out that the, um, uh, the, the radiation from the sun um, is partly controlled by the medic uh, magnetic field of the sun. And the, the magnetic field of the sun can, can, can uh, control the uh, cosmic rays. Well, let me see. Well, I'll, I'll come back into the other one. Here, a little bit more on the sunspots. You know, the, the sunspots and the solar radiation is coordinated with the major, uh, you know, like here's the inactivity in the sunspots low solar irradiance. And we had a, a, a cold spell there. You know, that's the middle, middle ice age, or um, yeah, the, the monitor minimum, mini ice age. And then here, there's another one, low spot, and you have another one, and, and so on. Uh, and here we are today. We are at uh, 2020. And uh, if you look at these, these curves of sunspots, it is definitely coming down. And uh, scientists expect that we'll have another modern minimum equivalent to the modern, well, modern minimum back in the 1600s. So if that's true, we can expect significant cooling coming up here. You know, we're not, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, huge global warming. Okay, and, and this, this here, this is a, one of the scientists that's come up with that, uh, Sundsmark, a, a Danish, uh, uh, a Swedish uh, climate scientist. He says, if, there's, if the sun is inactive, um, it affects the, the magnetic, magnetic rays, and then you have a higher cosmetic uh, rays uh, from the sun or, or, or from, from space, uh, because the sun is inactive and it's not stopping these cosmic rays, and you get more clouds, and therefore you have a cooler Earth. And then the other way, if you have an active sun, a lot of activity, and you have low cosmic rays from, from the uh, 
for space because of the ma ma magnetic field of the sun, you get fewer clouds and then you have a hotter Earth. Very simple kind of a model. Now, not all scientists agree on that, but uh, most scientists agree that the clouds have a lot to do with the, uh, um, the temperature on the Earth. And here's another graph that shows a very well cosmic rays with the sun spots. Um, the low activity and uh, high cosmic rays. Okay. And uh, this, this is just a uh, summary of that. Um, and, and here we have again the, uh, the projection, even NASA is predicting the solar cycle of 25. Uh, here, um, and you'll notice that the solar activity is getting very, very low. The solar cycles, are, they, they don't go as high. These are 11, 11 year cycles between those uh, peaks here. And uh, the monitor, monitor minimum back 400 years ago, and now we're you know, in this period of time. And uh, we believe, some scientists believe we're getting another major minimum here, which will impact the temperature. Um, Pacific decadal oscillations can also cause significant fluctuations in the climate, but uh, some scientists don't believe they're as significant as a solar uh, radiation. Um, and that, this is just a graph of the Pacific decadal oscillation. This is the um, you know, temperature in the atmosphere controlled by activity in the ocean, you know, and the ocean goes through cycles as well. Um, scientists like uh, Dr. Spencer, he also believes that this is a major determinant of uh, uh, global temperature. And uh, so here, here um, we see that the even over this period of time, from 2005 to 2014, it's only 10 years, but the the trend is only point. 0 0.023 degrees centigrade per decade do you know the average temperature of the ocean. So that's not a not a huge trend. So if you took that to 2100, you'd have an increase maybe of 0.23 degrees centigrade. So it's not a big contributor. Okay, now some other issues. Um, you'll remember back in 2015, December. Uh, many of the nations in the world signed this Paris Climate Agreement. Now, would that have solved the problem? Well, let's look. And I remember, uh, President Trump pulled us out of that agreement, and uh, and so the U.S. has not been will not be contributing or has not been contributing as much as they would otherwise have. So the agreement, it's, it's a work of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It deals with greenhouse gas emissions, mitigation, adaptation, and finance. Adopted in December 2015, but there, it wasn't planned to be actively worked on till this year, 2020. It was signed by 195 nations, but ratified by just 144. And scientists have determined um, that if you, well, it'll cost anywhere between 65 to $132 trillion to prevent global warming by 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. That's a major, major cost. The man thinks that they can control the temperature, um, you know, by certain mechanisms. Uh, so that's a major, major cost. Oh, I'm listening to this thing. Here, here are some of the uh, uh, implications of that, um, or, or some of the things they, they came up with. Um, to keep global temperature increase below two degrees centigrade, that was their target. Um, 186 countries submitted plans detailing how they would go about doing that. Uh, number, point number four, hundred billion dollars a year in climate finance to be paid by developing countries, you know, third world, not third world countries, but uh, 
you know, the richest countries in the world. And of course, the US would be the largest contributor to that fund to make this happen. And then countries should uh, reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. So that, that was their six major goals. Um, however, notice that the Obama administration agreed to, to uh, reach a, a target of uh, reducing U.S. greenhouse gas, 82% of which is carbon dioxide emission by 26% to 28% below its 2005 level. So we're five years away from doing that. However, China, which is still a developing country, uh, they don't have to do anything for the next 10 years. Uh, they can do whatever they want. They can, they can burn coal, as much coal as they want, but around 2030, they have agreed uh, to start to reducing um, fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels. So they have a very different impact. They, they take money from the US to achieve their goals, uh, but the US is, would be the major contributor to those funds. Okay, issue number eight, the UN IPCC climate models are not realistic. Why do we say that? Well, remember their, their target of them was to come up with the, uh, they believed that if we did nothing, we would warm up to five, five degrees more than we are today, let's say 2015. So five degrees more. Um, and they had a 90% confidence that they could do it using what they had suggested. But there are others that came up said, well, we, well, we can, we don't, we think we can do better than that. So th there's a whole range of, of, uh, of uh, targets there. And here's some predictions made by different uh, organizations, you know, going back to 1988, um, you know, the projection here is, this is at the highest, you know, up to uh, 2.53 degrees. And then 2007, um, you know, this darker line, so they, they're projecting lower and, and so on. So how's that working out? Well, here is the, the various organizations, many of them listed here, have run models and projected how much the temperature would, would rise. And so you can see here, here's all the, the models going from 1975 all the way to 2025. Now we're we're uh, you know we're in right here, but notice all those models a very large range you know from here all the way up to 1.5, and uh, one of them as low as uh, 0.3 degrees centigrade. But notice the actual measured temperature, the observations were only at 0.3, you know way below these models. So th those models aren't accurate for whatever reason. And we'll get into some of those reasons uh, uh, later, later on. Well, one of them is this here. Surface weather stations give less accurate measurements than and higher average temperatures than satellite measurements. And why is that? Well, look at this. Um, 1950s, for example, most people lived in rural areas. And uh, the, most of the weather stations were in rural areas, and uh, you know, then and the, those didn't change a whole lot. But they tend to be lower than temperature stations in urban areas. So why is that? Well, because uh, um, you know, much of the urban sprawl, if you will, they have uh, huge buildings, they have asphalt, they have uh, cement sidewalks. And that, you know, that collects heat. And, and so if you have a, a temperature measurement in one of these urban areas, they tend to be higher than those in rural areas. Well, if, you, if you're using the same station all the time, you know, like here, a number of years later, like 2010, well, that weather station is now in a urban area. And so it's gonna tend to uh, have higher temperatures. So if you, if you average the thousands of temperature stations in the U.S., 
and to come up with an average uh, temperature, well, in the next, you know, that 60 years, the average temperature is going to be higher just because those temperature stations are in uh, urban areas. So temperatures tend to be higher in the city. And uh, you can see here, like in the city, 92 degrees Fahrenheit, 85 in a rural area. That's quite a big difference. So it depends on which weather station you use that determines that. And you can see here, um, you know, over from 2000 to 2014, um, if you have temperature gauges in different places here in Allegheny, the temperature actually decreased in that area. And here, you know, the worst kind of areas, um, Reagan Airport, well, let's see if you have the temperature gauge in, on the airport, uh, on average, the temperature will increase quite significantly. So you have a whole range of changes depending on where those temperature gauges are. And that this one shows it probably the best. Um, here, here's the, uh, the number of stations that you have. And the US started out with uh, you know, something like, um, I think 11,500 weather stations in 1950. And then by 2000, they're down to 5,000. Well, look at the average temperature. Average temperature, while this, this number was quite, you know, didn't change a whole lot, the average temperature was, yeah, it varied, but just by half a degree or so. Then all of a sudden you drop the number of stations you're using and the average temperature measured is higher. Why is that? Well, it depends on which temperature gauges you keep. If you keep the ones that are that have uh, the city is now surrounding with pavement, obviously the you know, temperature is going to increase. So that determines the average temperature, you know, for the U.S. And that, what what is reported, and and so that has to be taken into consideration, and is not taken into consideration very well. Um, since 1979, we have started to use. Uh, satellite-based temperatures of the global lower atmosphere. So that's uh, roughly 40 years that we've been using that. And you can see there's, you know, there's not a whole lot of variation here. You know, zero, um, uh, as high as 0.7 in, uh, for one, one year. Uh, now, th th I show this to September 2020, but the December is actually 0 0.27 degrees centigrade. So we're down here already. So a lot of variation, but nothing significant. I mean, the average of this, uh, you know, down here, you, you don't see a whole lot of, for 40 years, you know, you go from uh, zero roughly to 0.27. That's not a big change. Uh, here's another projection that was made uh, you know, by Al Gore and others. In the 1960s, 1970s, there was only about 5,000 polar bears. And, uh, and obviously, it has increased a little bit by the time that uh, Gore came along and said, if we don't do something about uh, um, you know, stopping the global warming, there's not going to be any polar bears left. Well, guess what? Today, we have 25,000 polar bears in the Arctic area. So that, again, another wrong prediction. Sea levels are not rising as fast as predicted. Um, here's, um, here's some projections, you know, the centimeters, uh, 120 centimeters, um, you know, a lot, roughly, uh, I think, four feet or so. Or, or more, but uh, the, the projection, various projections, the different assumptions by 2100, you know, would, be, would be up by that much. Um, and and here's what was here's what was measured there. The change over 1880 to 1980 is uh, let's say two or three 
to minus two and three. So it, it just, uh, you know, a few, few centimeters. But here's, here's a more accurate measurement. Uh, from 1840 to 2020 today, the average um, uh, increase in, in uh, the sea level is about, let's see, here's point. Yeah, one one point four um, millimeter per year, and you can see here, you know, from uh, uh, six six point eight meter, and uh, this is up to a little bit more than uh, a little bit less than seven meter. So that the average sea level, you know, hasn't moved a whole lot in those hundred and um, or, or, yeah, 180 years. However, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, it's up to 420 or so now. And it started out here, um, you know, a little bit less than 300. So it has gone up significantly, but certainly it doesn't track, the, the uh, average sea level does not track that. Um, and here, the reality, and I give you just an example in, in Europe, you know, it turns out uh, um, the, the land, uh, the, the sea level seemed to be going lower uh, in Sweden. Well, why was that? The land is actually rising. In the Netherlands and in Belgium, as you know, uh, you know the, the land seems to be falling. You know, below sea level. And so you, you, you can't compare both of, both of those. Um, you know, someplace the land is sinking, someplace the land is rising. You've got to be careful what, how you measure that. Issue number 12. Uh, again, Al Gore said that the Arctic ice cap, the Arctic ice would disappear in five years. And uh, so here we see even 2012, 2013 in August, both in August, this has increased significantly. It's not gone away. And here's a, another one there. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, this, this can, yeah, let me go back to that. Yeah, you'll notice here, um, the, these are the, the thickness of ice, the, the amount of snow cover. Or, or ice volume, um, you know, it increases in the winter months and then comes down in the summer months and then goes back up. And you know, these different lines are the levels in different years. So then the average, you know, is in the middle of that. So again, this is no indication of a catastrophe. It, it comes and goes. And you, if you follow the newspapers, um, you know, you'll, you know, sometimes you get a story. Look at the number of the ice volume has, has decreased by this much in this month. Well, yes, it has. It's going towards the summer, but they don't mention that. You know, so it, it's just you know bad reporting. And uh, th this is another example. I mean, the average uh, you know doesn't change a whole lot. Okay, now here's here's a big one. You've heard that weather extremes are increasing, and I'll give you some examples. Um, you remember, Governor Brown said, uh, "You know the droughts. You know, first they were caused by uh, um, you know too hot, or, or sorry, too cold, and then then all of a sudden too hot. Well, has that been a problem for California? Well, if you look back to uh, 800, you know, we've been able to determine the, these red line are above the line, uh, less uh, precipitation and droughts. And you'll see there's periods of droughts and there's periods where it's not as dry, it's wetter. And it, historically, it goes up and down. Uh, and, but, and lately, it's been mostly blue, except for 1850, uh, there's a, period of time, a few years, where it was, uh, you know, it, it was uh, drier in California. And then mostly cold, 
and recently there's been a little bit more. Um, what are, are, are um, yeah, drier, more drought. So, and, and so they complain about that. But if you look at in comparison to what it was in the past, it's not much. Okay, so at, on average, 1900 to 2000, no change, you know, in the drought percentage since 2000, 1901. So yes, it changes, but nothing to be worried about. Okay, now we get through some storms. In, intense hurricanes since 1880 per decade. And these are category three, four, and five hurricanes. And uh, you've heard weathermen say, well, it's getting bad. You know, got to do something about this. Well, look at back in the 1880s, um, here for a hundred years or so. Yep, that's you know, down here, just three of them. And here next year, it's seven, six, five, five, and so on. And yep, we've got a bad one between 2000 and 2009. But on average, that curve is going down. It's nothing uh, unusual. And here is just an example of, uh, um, well, th this is the, some of the worst hurricanes and the number of fatalities. Well, you'll see back the worst one, 1900, you know, 10,000 and so. Uh, but that's back in the 1900. Now, 2017, we had a bad one, uh, 2982 deaths. And uh, from and most of them, you know, men are much lower than this. And yet the, the cities are more built up than they were 100 years ago. So again, nothing unusual. And the same thing with tornadoes. The, the annual count of U.S. tornadoes, um, you know, there are not there are not more, you know, greater than the strength of uh, of the, the the average number has actually come down. Again, there was a bad one in 2011, but uh, on average, nothing to be worried about. So strong, violent tornadoes greater than F3. Uh, again, there is a very bad one in the mid 1970s. Um, but uh, again, here's a, a low one, a very low one. Uh, global tropical storms of hurricane frequency, again, now there's the, the tropical storms here between 40 and 80. Yeah, you know, it goes up and down. Uh, here's this especially US annual heat wave index. Um, notice what, when was it? You know, people say we've had some of the hottest years recently. Well, when did the hottest years happen? 1930s. You know, during the Depression years. That really was hot. And uh, you know, we've had ups and downs since. Since then, we've had higher here, but in the 1930s, it was especially bad. And the average temperature per year from uh, um, 1900 to 2018, again, a large vari vari variation, but you see the peak again is in 1930, 1934. Uh, US temperature, um, you know, nothing to be concerned about, just uh, uh, less than half a degree variation there. Uh, the percentage of days over 95 degrees is another way to measure the heat waves. And again, the peak is in the 1930s. Uh, let's see. Well, then, then we come to, again, the, the manipulation which people, uh, some of these organizations, they adjust the temperatures after the fact. So here, um, here's the, the U.S. temperature from 1880 to 2000, and it, it clearly you know, it shows that the 1930s was a hot spell, and here we're lower than the hot spell. Well, now the, these curves have been adjusted, um, and you'll notice that, hey, we're right up here to the 1930s, and we're, no near, we're nowhere near that. So there's manipulation of data which occurs that we have to be aware of. Uh, frequency of wildfires, yep, we've always had wildfires and uh, this year had some bad uh, wildfires. And uh, going back 
1985 to, to here, so that not been changed. But, but then if you look, go back further to, you know, here's a, let's see, back into the um, 1800s, from that 1920s, um, you'll see it, it, we had a, much more acres burned back then than we do this year. But if you read the paper, what do they show you? They show you this curve you know, from here to here, 1960 to 2018. Well, yeah, we've, we've increased a little bit more acreage, a little bit, but nothing compared to what it was 100 years ago. And here's another way, let's see, in 1916, uh, total acreage burned, uh, millions of uh, acres here, 50, and uh, now we're down to uh, you know four or five from from sixty to uh, two thousand, and yep, we got one bad year here, and we're up to ten. But again, it's nothing like this year. Um, this is another one showing show a snow extent. If if it really has been getting warmer all the time, we should be seeing less snow. Well, what are we seeing? From 1967 to here, where we actually see an average, the amount of snow coverage is increasing. It's not decreasing. Um, here's another one. Um, the snow mass for the northern hemisphere. And uh, it's showing a, a, a range for the last four or five years here. This, this year with the average in between. And then snow mass for 2019, I'm sorry, this average was from 1982 to 2012. And that, but for the last year, 2019 to 20, it is actually higher than the average. So are we getting warmer? That curve wouldn't tell you that. Okay, now a few other um, points. People don't, uh, realize that the UN IPC charter limits the uh, scientists to identifying only human causes of global warming. Like, don't look at natural causes, just look at human causes. So here's what it says. IPC charter from the outset has been to assess on a comprehensive, objective, open and transparent basis, the scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information relevant to understanding the scientific basis of risk of human-induced climate change, its potential impacts and options for adaptation and mitigation. So what they're charged with is looking for human causes of climate change. So I guess, and, and that's why it's, their reports emphasize human causes. Uh, here's a, just a quick rundown for the, the five major IPC reports. First of all, the, the first one ignored satellite data, which is more accurate than, than uh, uh, land-based measurement stations. Uh, the next one, there were significant alterations after approval by the scientists. That is, the report was not approved by scientists. They were bureaucrats taking what the scientists had given them and making it sound very bad. Report number three claimed that the 20th century showed unusual warming. Report number four completely devaluated climate changes and solar activity. In other words, it became obvious now that solar activity uh, is a major cause of global warming, but they don't address that. And then report number five, they said the confidence has increased to 90 to 95% despite no global warming for 15 years. And uh, you remember that curve where I showed you that the measured temperatures over the last uh, 40 years or so are much lower than all of their models say. And, and yet the UN says we have 90 to 95% confidence in our models. Number five, the uh, UN IPCC officials admit that the real agenda 
of the, the IPCC is to redistribute wealth. Well, here's what one official had to say. We, the UNIPC, redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is an environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. Said by Dr. Inanova. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard for them to admit that, but that's really what this is about. Okay, and then the final uh, issue I want to just look at briefly is uh, you might have heard, uh, especially politicians like Obama and Kerry saying, you know, 95% of scientists agree that we have global warming and, uh, and it's caused by humans. We need to do something. 97%. Um, this is one of the most widely repeated claims in the debate over global warming. 97% of scientists agree that climate change is man-made and dangerous. This claim is not only false, but its presence in the debate is an insult to science. John Kerry, Secretary of State in 2014, he quotes that 97% of scientists agree climate change is real, man-made, and dangerous, also said by Obama. Now, there were seven studies done by different groups, seven climate consensus studies, and guess what? They all came out with similar percentages, 97% of scientists agree. How did they get that? Well, they, here, here's what the, the conclusion, depending on exactly how you measure the expert consensus, it's somewhere between 90 and 100% that agree humans are responsible for climate change. But most of our studies find that 97% consensus among publishing climate scientists. Um, that's a very large number. So take a look at one of those surveys and see how they came up with that, the Doran survey. They had a two part questions or, or two questions that I made up the survey, just two. Said, when compared with pre 1800 levels, do you think that mean global temperatures have generally risen, fallen, or remained relatively constant? Well, I, I mean, most of us would say yes. Yeah, we, we agree. So that's going to be a large percentage. Do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? Well, then what is significant? You know, it's, it's very subjective. You know, you can't get an accurate measurement. Here's that survey was sent to 10,000 Earth scientists, but it was limited to academic and government workers. You know, government workers uh, by default, work on the agenda. They're bureaucrats, they have to agree. Solar scientists and meteorologists were not asked about this. They're not included in the survey. They got responses from 3,000 of them. Uh, question one, yes, not more than 90% agree. Question two, 82% agree. But they, they said, well, 97% of climate scientists agree. Where'd they get the 97%? Well, uh, okay, I think the next graph is going to show that. Yeah, here. <clears throat> the survey sent out, they got 349 uh, six back. Of those, there were only 77 climate scientists. And the climate scientists answering yes to number two is 75. So we divide. 75 by 90 by 77, you get 97 percent. All these others are not included in that. So they, they have a goal of what number to come up with, and they just put it out that way. So then drawing conclusions, uh, why do sector scientists think Earth's climate is unstable? Well, first of all, remember those climate models, they're just faulty. The, the problem is with the secular scientists, most of them 
believe that there's positive feedback in the system. And actually, if you consider that it really is negative, you get something that, uh, you get results that agree uh, with, the, with the negative uh, model. And that's why the, you know, the measured values agree with the negative. Um, there is fraudulent politicized research you know, use of surface measurements versus satellite temperature measurements. Some of the data is just cherry pick data. And we saw there's also examples of manipulated data. So this is why you get uh, faulty uh, results. What the news media isn't telling you is that there has been no global warming 19 years or so. Global warming from 78 to 98 has been replaced by global cooling. The Antarctic ice sheet is growing, not melting. Sea level is rising perhaps seven inches per century, not the 20 feet that were projected by some. Four of the past five years have set record snowfalls. Carbon dioxide is too small of a percentage of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to cause global warming. Severe storms are not more frequent than, than normal, and so can, oceans are not acidic. Ocean levels are not rising as quickly as they predicted. So what should we as Christians do about this? Well, we need to commit to viewing the world from God's perspective. And that goes back to this Genesis 8.22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. We have to understand and rely on scripture as a foundation for life. We we'll use the Bible to understand the world and evaluate all problems. And we need to help inform other believers, promote the truth and oppose false belief with gentleness and respect. So in conclusion, uh, we've seen that the UN IPCC climate change models have failed visibly. There's no significant warming. Uh, for the last 19 years, sea levels only increased by a small amount. Man-made pauses are insufficient uh, to produce global warming. The natural causes, the things that I mentioned, uh, for climate change are more credible. That's the sun energy alone is not so insufficient, is insufficient. Cosmic radiance for sunspots can explain the climate change that we see and the Pacific decadal oscillation may explain some of this climate change. The, Par the Paris climate agreement is not a solution for a non-existent problem. We're trying to solve the wrong problem and therefore getting the wrong uh, result. So in conclusion, climate change is not a crisis. Let's not panic about it. And if I relate this to some of the other science issues, you know, we as creation scientists, we we um, look at evolution. Why do people believe in evolution? You know, well, man thinks he can control you know, how we evolve. We can, we can evolve to much more advanced uh, uh, beings if we just control it. And in the case of climate change, man believes that he can control climate. And uh, so they both have the same fallacy. Uh, you may have seen a recent story that Bill Gates is uh, funding a project to uh, uh, seed the clouds to try and uh, decrease the average temperature of the, uh, uh, of the earth. And then there are things like this. Man thinks he can control the environment. Man thinks he can control how we evolve. So with that, I'll bring it to conclusion. The, um, as I said, I, I will have these... Um, uh, slides up on the website, and I'll, I'll send a pointer to uh, uh, to Jim, and uh, he can point you to that. I've also got a, a large uh, on my website. I've got a file called uh, "Refuting GWA: Refuting Global Warming Alarmism." We're not refuting that there is some warming, but we're refuting uh, the alarmism that people are associated with it. And uh, I, I expand on the reasons that I've given my talk here. Uh, a lot of references are given in that file. It's a rather long uh, uh, PDF file, but you're welcome to uh, just go to that, click on that, 
or, or just type that in. It's my website name slash refuting GWA. Okay. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, would you like to take some questions? Well, sure. So people have questions. Okay, let me, uh, everybody, uh, if you can, unmute your microphone. And uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. I'll ask you one. Okay. Um, the uh, CO2 measurements are taken from uh, Mauna Loa and I assume other other mountains too. The, well, the the, um, the the curve I showed is is only from that mountain because it is so isolated, and uh, they have a good measuring station up there. Okay. And and uh, most most science agree, and those those numbers are pretty accurate. Hmm. I, I would I would be surprised that um, you wouldn't have CO two exuding from a volcanic mountain. Yeah. Oh, I, well, I don't think that that is um, an active volcano there now. And I don't I don't know where the measurement station is exactly on that. Uh -huh. um, and I haven't I haven't dig, dug into that, but I, I just uh, take it granted because all scientists agree that that. Uh, is, is a valid uh, marker. Okay. Well, I don't know about all. Um, Larry Vardaman reported about visiting the uh, station there, and he, he was of the impression that it was deliberately very, very difficult to get to, that the, um, the directions to get to it were pretty bogus, and uh, it was just really, really hard. And um, his impression was that maybe they have something to hide. Did, uh, did he actually try to get up there? Yeah, he did. He visited. Oh, okay. So he was right in the station. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to ask him. Yeah. Really hot. Anybody have any questions? It's a very complicated topic. Yes. It's a very controversial topic, obviously. It's a hot topic. <laughs> there, there, um, the Corn, Cornwall Alliance, is, have you ever heard of that? Cornwall Alliance, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Meisner. He, he runs a, uh, you know, he's a Christian and he, he's, he has a, uh, writes papers and has uh, speakers on to uh, talk about global warming and climate change. I have a question. Yeah. My friend Sharon says that this year we're in um, the type of um, situation where we're going to get a lot less rain and a lot less snow than normal. Do you know how they predict that? Um, I, I do not accurately. I mean, if I, I live in Washington, and we have a very wet winter, a very wet. Or I, th I think it's above average, but I'm not sure. Um, I don't know, if California, are you average now, or are you above average rain? Well, she's worried about the snowfall. We, she likes to have 12 feet of pack of snow. And she said, because we're in La Nina this year, we're going to get less snow and less rain, and it's going to be really dry, and we're going to have a lot of fires in California. Yeah. I know, I know we've had a lot of snow up in the mountains, too. And ski areas are active. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think you did a really good job. I, I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I've been looking at this for a long time, and I'm, uh, my last uh, work was in I had a consultancy where I consulted on high tech um, projects. But uh, as I uh, backed out of uh, that, eventually I just uh, devoted my time to researching this and and doing apologetics and giving lectures on uh, various uh, topics that uh, intersect science and the Bible. Well, folks, let's give him a round of applause, shall we? Yay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Yep, Appreciate you're welcome. It. Okay. Well, Lord bless, and we'll talk to you again. Yep. God bless. Okay, bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.